One of the more frightening events in anesthesia is laryngospasm, the protective reflex spasmodic closure of the vocal cords that occurs when the vocal cords are stimulated. In laryngospasm, vocal cord closure can be so forceful that it can prevent ventilation or even the passage of an endotracheal tube. Avoiding vocal cord stimulation when the level of anesthesia is light can usually prevent laryngospasm. However, laryngospasm can occur even in the best of care, especially in patients with irritable airways such as those with asthma, COPD, smokers, and those with upper or lower respiratory infection. Complications include life-threatening hypoxia, post-obstructive pulmonary edema, and even cardiac arrest. A quick review of laryngeal muscle movements will help us understand why laryngospasm prevents ventilation. There are three major types of movement. Movements affecting tension of the vocal cords, movements swinging the vocal cords open and closed, and movements that close off and protect the larynx. Movement affecting vocal cord tension, like the pitch of the voice, occurs by rocking the thyroid cartilage forward and backward on the cricoid cartilage at the cricothyroid joint. Watch the tension in the vocal cords as this person changes pitch to appreciate the dynamic muscle control. And take a breath. Uh, Movements that swing the vocal cords open or closed occur by swiveling the arytenoid cartilages on the back of the cricoid cartilage. Our vocal cords pivot constantly during the breathing cycle, opening more widely during inhalation to minimize resistance to breathing. Movements that close off the top of the larynx protect it during swallowing or from aspiration. Muscles that surround the outside of the larynx, called extrinsic muscles, move the larynx up and down within the neck to support this function. For example, during inhalation, the entire larynx falls in the neck, a movement that pulls the epiglottis up and away from the glottis, further opening the airway. During coughing and swallowing, the larynx rises in the neck. This higher position causes the epiglottis and the back of the tongue to drop downward over the glottis, closing it off. Laryngospasm consists of the combination of all of these different types of muscle movement. This is a typical view of the larynx during intubation. Here you can see the curved epiglottis above, the bulges of the arytenoids below. The triangular gap between the vocal cords is called the glottis. Above and to the sides of the true vocal cords are the false vocal cords. Look how close the esophagus is to the larynx. This larynx is about to go into laryngospasm, caused by touching the left arytenoid with the tip of the endotracheal tube in a patient who was too lightly anesthetized. Note the dynamic closure of the vocal cords, the closure of the false cords, the mounding of the paraglottic tissues by elevation of the larynx, and the folding of the epiglottis over the glottic opening. When you see laryngospasm, don't force the endotracheal tube through the glottis because you could traumatize the larynx. Instead, stop and break the laryngospasm. This patient's laryngospasm broke quickly with positive pressure ventilation and deepening his anesthetic. Let's look at techniques to break laryngospasm using positive pressure in this staged recreation. To break laryngospasm, stop stimulating the vocal cords. Direct all efforts to delivering oxygen. Ask for help. Once triggered in a semi-conscious patient, laryngospasm often persists for a dangerously long time because the part of the brain that would normally turn it off is effectively asleep. Hypoxia, potentially leading to cardiac arrest, can develop quickly if the spasm isn't broken. Apply your ventilation mask tightly against the face and provide forceful positive pressure breaths with your ventilation bag while performing a jaw thrust. The jaw thrust is important. Thrusting the jaw forward lifts the epiglottis and tongue off the glottic opening, rocks the larynx forward, counteracting some of the tension bunching the cords together, pulls on the area epiglottic folds, which connect the sides of the epiglottis to the back of the arytenoids, opening a small gap between the vocal cords, and stimulates the patient because it's painful, 
perhaps awakening the patient out of stage two towards consciousness. You may need someone to squeeze the bag while you perform a jaw thrust. All of these actions are directed at creating a gap between the vocal cords. Once you have that gap, then the positive pressure breath forces oxygen below the cords. This pressurizes that space and forces the cords further apart. You must have a tight mask seal for this to work. Positive pressure plus jaw thrust usually, though not always, breaks the spasm. If the spasm doesn't break, you may need to give a small dose of sedative or muscle relaxant. Be prepared to support ventilation. Prevention is better than treatment. To prevent laryngospasm, avoid stimulating the vocal cords in a semi-conscious patient. Ensure the pharynx is clear of secretions, especially before extubation. Extubate either awake or in a deep plane of anesthesia, not during the semi-conscious anesthesia stage two. Be vigilant, be prepared, and react quickly if it occurs, and never hesitate to ask for help.